Um, hi. A um, bit of an unorthodox talk, um, not only having two speakers, um, but we also want to show you um, a video that's actually very much in the theme um, David was just discussing. Um, that was the perfect introduction. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, benevolent memes and how to spread them. Um, so not a lot of time, we'll jump straight in. Um, here's our question. What will determine the state of the world by 2025? Um, here's what it's not. It won't be powerful new computers. It won't be breakthroughs in medicine. It won't even be 100% renewable energy. Well, what could we possibly mean? The contents of people's heads. The technology on its own, of course, doesn't do anything. So we, what we mean by this is the beliefs, desires, and ideas that members of the general public have about how to apply and engage with new technologies. So here's the problem. The field of future thought has a PR problem. Probably the most important conversation humanity needs to be having is going on, but amongst the noise, it's not much more than a whisper. Future thought needs more benevolent means. Um, by memes, we mean units of cultural information that multiply, spread, and affect the behavior of social animals. So let's have a look at the kind of memes that the general public is having a look at at the moment. You should be familiar. Not exactly flattering. No thanks. So, a tiny number of people are talking about these things constructively, and this is extremely risky. Why? Twenty twenty five will be determined by the way that we as a species feel about, think about, and interact with coming technologies. So we need only look at the development of research in stem cells, nuclear power, and controlled substances to see that public perception can severely hinder the development and application of technologies. On the other hand, public demand can speed up areas of research in comparatively less urgent ideas, for example, male pattern baldness. <laughs> so, how can we fix this? Unfortunately, it's not enough for good, I for, for good thinkers to have good ideas. Right? So, they also have to be excellent self-promoters, and they also, if they want to keep the integrity of their work intact, have to work as full-time PR managers for their ideas. Now, if encountered in the wrong ways, a layperson might conclude that the field of future thought is terrifyingly dangerous, naively utopian, or outright immoral. Needless to say, this is a first impression that can only be made once. It's crucial that we communicate that transhumanist thinking is not characterized by some insane cult of technology, but by ordinary individuals who are taking the challenges of being human very seriously. That's no killer robots. We as a community need to be able to translate urgent ideas into memes that are accessible to anyone, including those with minimal common assumptions and background beliefs. So the challenge that we've taken up is to distribute forward-thinking memes in a way that's informative, memorable, critical, but optimistic, but above all, accessible. This is the thing, accessible. So over a period of nine months last year, um, uh, Marco and I and our animator, Mihai Badik, uh, bootstrapped an animated video that functions as an introduction to the field of future thought that anyone could understand. Um, so we're going to play you the video, and then my uh, co-writer, co-director, Marco Vega, will meet you on the other side to share some insights. Now, hopefully, this will all work flawlessly. These are the three key areas of transhumanist thought, and we've only begun to scratch the surface. The three supers, super longevity, super intelligence, and super well-being, 
might radically change human history if, or when, they are realised. One of the main issues facing transhumanist ideals is that they are seen as far-fetched, or perceived as just science fiction. But this is a big mistake. We are already transhuman. We're living longer, integrating more with technology, and emphasising quality of life. We're in the process of redesigning what it is to be human, only the effects are still so subtle and so slow that it doesn't look like much. But these changes will come faster and faster, and it's only wise to be an active, informed participant in the next stage of human development. Thanks for watching. Is this working? This on? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you did, we are planning on releasing more episodes uh, for the series, uh, hopefully later this year. Um, and of course, uh, none of this would have been possible without our animator, Mihai Badik, who was feeling under the weather and couldn't make it today. So, um, Peter talked about the theoretical background and the motivations for the video, and I would like to share some insights on the cognitive tools we used for the video. Um, but first, um, it's worth highlighting the aims of the video. So, um, our first goal was for people to come away with a better understanding of transhumanism and a desire to share it around. Um, second, was to propagate the meme of the three supers as a catchy summary for the goals of transhumanism. And third, was to fight a dangerous meme, the meme that future thought is always dystopian. So we spent a lot of time thinking about how best to achieve these goals, and we ended up incorporating ideas from psychology, marketing, um, and persuasion theory in order to get the main concepts across. So I'm gonna talk about a, a, a short five things to do that we urge future thinkers employ when trying to broadcast their ideas. First, be aware of weirdness costs. So sometimes a person will decide an idea is just too weird before even engaging with the arguments. Um, a useful framework for understanding this in terms of weirdness costs. So when encountering a new concept, people have a limited number of weirdness points they're willing to spend before rejecting it. Though, of course, the budget varies from person to person. So in our video, we hash things out in terms of familiar concepts and ideas, showing how they naturally extend from already held intuitions in a way that people end up entertaining a concept before they think it's weird. So if no weirdness costs, then no rejection. Second, um, try and use bite-sized concepts as an easy way to understand and share ideas. So the three supers uh, were designed to capture kind of three significant transhumanist goals in a highly accessible and memorable manner. The theory behind them is the notion of chunking, uh, popular in circles of memory research. So by structuring the videos into three neat sections, one for each of the super, and then unpacking them into concepts with corresponding colors, shapes, and thinkers, we were able to make central points more memorable. The meme of the three supers is already involving. Um, I heard that David Pierce later today will be talking about the triple S civilization. Third, be sympathetic towards people's intuitive negative reactions. 
It's important to come to terms with the fact that transhumanism and futurist thinking is, to most people, just unintuitive and scary. As Peter discussed earlier, um, most people have only encountered these concepts through dystopian fiction, films, books. So for us to talk as if there are no worries or dangers in transhumanist thinking um, just sets off alarm bells. But by coming across as self-aware, concerned about the weaknesses in our own position, I think this is an incredibly important way in allowing for un unfamiliar ideas to be taken seriously. Whoops. Oops. I'm carrying my brush. So, as a response to this, this is not in the right order. Okay, sorry about that. Um, as a response to this, uh, we think that building intuition pumps to circumnavigate these intuitive reactions is important. So we highly recommend using what Daniel Dennett calls intuition pumps to elicit intuitive reactions to an idea. So we use them to introduce each of the three supers. Um, if constructed properly, they allow one to avoid negative gut reactions by showing how seemingly radical conclusions are natural extensions to already held beliefs and intuitions. This is an excellent method of circumnavigating resistance, or in other words, reducing weirdness point cost. Oh, okay. So, um, do you remember the beginning of each of the three sections of the video? We kind of, it's a thought experiment yeah. that kind of presents ideas in a way that seems very intuitive to you. Just so, you know, imagine a virus infects the whole world, how much money we put into it. A lot of people will say, well, everything, you know, that's two billion people. But don't tell them it's aging. Kind of, it's like, oh. So, before rejecting the idea outright, they kind of, they have uh, an intuition to kind of go with that line of argument. Sorry, yeah, should have defined that. So, uh, number five, um, present ideas in accessible and attractive medium. People tend to remember only 10% of what they hear, 20% of what they read, and about 80% of what they see and do. Humans are highly visual creatures. Testament to this is the fact that animated versions of online talks and lectures are viewed significantly more often, and in the case of RSA lectures, as high as 130 times more often than their non-animated counterparts. This is not dumbing down, it's not selling out, it's simply being aware of how humans like to learn. So, by coming to this conference, you have all become a network, uh, a node in a network of memetic propagation. The kinds of memes we all carry pr will propagate and will impact on the shape of 2025. Peter and I are always looking for important ideas to distribute. If you have them, we'd like to help get them out there. We believe there is a responsibility to distribute memes that increase the likelihood that 2025 will be a stepping stone to a better world. Thanks for listening. Roland Schiefer, I have two questions. The first one, I 100% agree with your approach. I love the positive view. But it seems when you want not only to attract attention as a publicist, but to sell, the bad view seems to be sometimes appropriate. I think of Robert de Garis, who uh, predicts the artillect war, something that costs uh, two or three billion people's life at least, if not more. He actually got funding from a Chinese research center and he's quite happy there. So you can actually, predicting horrible things that your work will do, get funding. Surprising. Second question, you refer to memes in there. Uh, came up with Dawkins, I think had their Hey Davis, uh, Susan Blackmore, meme machine, and seemed to have died off. I was surprised that you put them in again. Do they have a revival? Uh. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so the first thing. Um, so talking about uh, potential dystopias, that might be a good way to get funding. I'm sure um, 
uh, scary ideas sell well, um, it probably increases existential risk um, in so far as um, the chances of our, of our survival over the next, I don't know, uh, 30, 40 years, I think is going to dramatically decrease if we have a very hostile response to the sorts of technologies that might actually be the things that allow us to survive it. Um, as for a resurgence of memes, um, uh, I can't speak to that. I can't say that our usage of it is suddenly bringing it back to life. Um, we actually talked a little bit about the, the use of this term, and we weren't sure. We thought, does it do more than an idea? Um, there's a word, the word idea. Does, it, does meme have more of a function? Um, I feel like it does. If you turn um, like a good idea into something that can easily be spread around, like into a form that can kind of move from person to person easily, um, there, like, it seems like meme is actually having some, some useful role there. Um, it's something above and beyond just an idea. Uh, how much do they cost, and how are you hoping to fund for uh, the fund the production of them? Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, <laughs> do you want to take this? Um, um, so we actually managed to create this one on zero budget. We called in every favor that we knew. Or we like we're fortunate in that we're surrounded by some amazing creative people, and we managed to to motivate people enough and get people excited enough about it that they were willing to put time into it. Now, that's not a sustainable model, and so uh, we can only uh, spend favors for so long. Um, so uh, we are constantly on the hunt for people who are willing to um, kind of work with us, potentially even funding us, such that we can get uh, better ideas out there faster. We're already working on a, um, on a few episodes, and uh, yeah, if you want to come talk to us, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Hear from you. Sorry. Next question. Can I, can I ask... Um, who your target audience was for the video. So, like when we train people to speak uh, to leadership audiences in government, we talked about, you know, 14 to 16 year old as, as a bright 14 to 16 year old is, is the way you pitch it. When you take business leaders, depending on where they are in the world, the closer to Asia you get, the more kind of mature you can be in the language you use. Um, what sort of age group, what, what sort of target profile did you have for this? Thank you. Um, I mean, in terms of knowledge, essentially, we wanted this to be a 101 introduction. So anyone, like, there's, there's been a huge kind of growth of, sorry, um, of people watching kind of very short YouTube videos. And the age bracket is quite large. I imagine it's mostly, you know, late teens, 20s, and early 30s people kind of watching these kind of videos. But the idea was a 101. People have never heard of the concepts before. Kind of make sure the introduction isn't one of shock and kind of death and scariness. Um, so we had a, hard, a long discussion about whether we go into kind of lots of details about the downsides and the details kind of every single gene that we might be modding in. But we didn't want to scare people off, not sound it technical, really just make sure the emotional concept comes across um, as a way of kind of get the intuition that, right, all future thinking isn't just scary. Okay, next here. Um, hello. Um, uh, could you maybe tell me some, something about uh, the way this positive association is made with technology because it can be made on a very kind of shallow uh, level but on a deeper level as well. Um, for example, uh, we have uh, seen in the past 10-15 years uh, ASIMO being built as a, a kind of a, a almost a entertaining uh, robot that uh, makes us kind of uh, um, admire the, uh, the possible future but uh, if they had built a, a robot that can close a valve in Fukushima on time they might have uh, had a much safer uh, cleaning up of the uh, of the effects of the disaster, and that led to a DARPA challenge to build a humanoid robot that could uh, do that. So, and they admitted that uh, you know we were they said we were afraid that if these robots could be used in military purposes, you know, so let's not build them. Let's build robots that are happy and that play violins and and things like that. So it's uh, I would so it's it's not just about a uh, how the association is, uh, so what the association is, is, but how it is made. Uh, so maybe um, maybe that could be part of uh, this message as well. Um, so I think people are more acceptant of using technology to change the outside world. So mm -hmm. external robots, you know, we can have slave bots or 
you know, talk about sex policy, so people wouldn't feel so on the outside. The area that we think people have a strong intuition against and are scared of is kind of changing human nature from within, accepting the fact that we have kind of Darwinian baggage, so to speak, and that, you know, we're not perfect beings, we're not angels, as we like to believe um, 200 years ago, you know, the peak of rationality, that we need to change ourselves on self, either through, you know, genetic engineering or inside chip. This is where we have kind of almost a repulsion, like I did early on when kind of here around transhumanism. Um, but to come to terms with the fact that we're not perfect, we are weak, but we could improve ourselves with technology on the inside is kind of the target area that we think uh, we wanted to kind of approach to the video. Because there's plenty of people that are okay with external technologies. Of course, let's make Google cars, let's make robots kind of do our stuff on the outside. So that's the kind of focus of this. All right, thank you very much. Excellent job.